All right, we are now live. Good afternoon, everyone. I can say good afternoon for me because it is 12 o'clock Eastern here in on the East Coast, obviously. I am just outside of Philadelphia. And welcome to our Vet Girl YouTube live event. Super excited that you all are here or will be here shortly. Uh, God, I'm looking out my window. It's a nice sunny day. A little couple of clouds here in the Philadelphia area, but uh, wherever you are logging in from, from around the country, around the world, you know the drill. We always love when you type in and let us know where you are logging in from. So I want to say hello. My name is Garrett Pachtinger. If this is your first YouTube live event, I'm a critical care specialist and the co-founder of VetGirl. I will be here with you today with Dr. Burton. Very excited. Dr. Burton, where are you logging in from? I'm logging in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, it is it is August, so I'm assuming no snow on the ground there for you. It's probably a nice warm day, I hope. Nice warm day, nice sunny day. Actually, no snow yet. I'm sure it's in the forecast soon. <laughs> yeah, it's like 80 in the morning, 40 at night. I'm not kidding, because Justine, as we all know, Justine from Vet Girl is, is a Minnesota person as well. So we know Minnesota very, very well. But welcome, welcome. So yeah, please go ahead and type in where you are logging in from. We have, let's see, uh, Iowa. Oh, getting ready for the Iowa State Fair. That sounds awesome. We have two people from Iowa. Jose from Portugal. Maria from Hudson Valley, New York. Well, Maria, I, I'm sorry, Marla, I believe. Marla or Maria, I can't tell. I apologize. I grew up in Rockland County, New York, so not far from there. We have Montreal, Park City, Utah. So, Utah excuse me. So absolutely, please go ahead and continue to type in where you are logging in from. We love going through here and seeing not only nationally here in the U.S. where I'm based and, and Dr. Burton is based, but all across the globe where everyone is logging in from. We have California, Utah, Florida, Iowa. So keep typing in. But I want to be very, very respectful of everyone's time here and at least start the housekeeping process so we can get into the important part of our lecture today. We're going to be talking about navigating canine leptospirosis and our diagnostic testing. I know for me, clinic, clinically, sometimes it can be a little bit confusing to know what test should I run, why, when, where, and that's what Dr. Burton is here for today. So let's go on into our housekeeping and get the ball rolling. The first thing, thank you so much to Merck Animal Health. You all know that when we've had the pleasure of an amazing educational partner like Merck Animal Health sponsoring a session, it is completely free worldwide race approved to get your information and to get your CE. So thank you so much to Merck Animal Health for being here with us today and being an amazing educational partner. Now, importantly, here's how to get your CE certificate. You have a QR code on your screen as well as a URL. So if you typed into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash VG, and then today's date, which is 08-10-22, it'll take you to a little form to fill out. The QR code, if you use that camera on your phone, will take you to that exact same page. Fill that out, and within a couple of days, we will email you your CE certificate after verifying attendance. We are going to keep this open 30 minutes after the session ends. That means 1 o'clock Eastern time. It will end, and I'll close it down. But go ahead and please fill that out, and I'll put it on the screen later to remind you as a refresher. If you're obviously we're on YouTube, I know YouTube, you have that small little uh, screen on your window, that little bottom right button, that little open square box. If you click on it, it'll maximize the window to your complete screen. I hope you guys have checked out our Vet Girl offerings. One of the things that I really like to talk about, it's a great value add as part of your membership, is our certificate program. Currently, we have nine different certificates out. It's part of your membership. It's value add. Take advantage of those. Right now, we're giving over 200 hours of new CE every year. But like this event, it's recorded, archived, and placed in our on-demand library afterwards so you can watch it when it's convenient for you. And really, the way we love educating it's a multimedia approach to education. So whether you like watching webinars like this, listening to podcasts, watching videos, reading blogs, what we try to do is provide a multimedia approach to education so you can learn in the best ways for you to get that information. Lastly, if you have not signed up for our Vet Girl Conference, we are just a couple of weeks away and it's going to be in Dr. Burton's backyard at the Radisson Blue in the Mall of America back in Minnesota. So make sure you do have a couple of seats that are left open. It's an awesome experience for those that have not been to a Vet Girl U yet. So please go ahead, sign up for Vet Girl U. I guarantee it's a boutique conference experience you will be sorry to miss and super excited to be part of. 
With that said, I know you're not here to listen to me today. Dr. Burton, if you can give our audience a little bit of a background of what you're doing right now, where you are. I know you said Minnesota, but where? What are you doing there? I'm going to drop myself out of this screen and then please take it away. Let's hear your information. The floor is yours. And again, thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much, Gary. It's so good to see so many people from all over the country and world. That's super neat. Um, as Gary said, I'm Dr. Burton. Um, I am currently a clinical pathologist and parasitologist at the University of Minnesota. Um, I also, my other hat that I wear is I'm senior, senior associate dean of academic and student affairs. So I do a lot of different things at the University of Minnesota, and I'm based here in um, actually in St. Paul. So thank you for having me. Um, and we'll talk today about. Um, Leptospira of diagnostic tests. So hopefully by the end of this, you will understand or, or at least be reminded of what the common CBC and biochemistry findings are. We'll talk a little bit about the different types of tests that are available to you. There's so many, so I've just selected a few of my favorites or at least the ones that I have commonly have questions with. And then um, the biggest question that I get on the clinical floor is how should I approach this in a vaccinated dog? And so hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better idea of what the limitations are of the tests and which um, you can do that. So when I'm on the floor, um, the biggest question that I get from my colleagues is, um, okay, I, I feel like I'm seeing more leptospira or gosh, why is this so challenging to diagnose? And so it's not, it, it is true. Um, we are seeing increased incidence of leptospirosis. When I was a vet student, I remember learning that it was a disease commonly of large breed dogs, usually those that lived a really fun outdoor lifestyle when hiking and fishing and all of those great things. We're now finding with um, just urban sprawl uh, and climate change um, that now there's increased interactions between dogs and their wildlife. Um, maintenance hosts, specifically in peri-urban settings. So now that idea of just seeing this in dog, large breed dogs is sort of becoming something not as common. We're seeing it in all sorts of dogs. I remember my first case that I saw um, as a clinician was in a Maltese that had uh, tongue necrosis and was being presented to the small animal dentistry service. So what makes them so um, great at what they do and why is it so challenging for us to diagnose it and what, you know, some of those types of things. So these guys are incredibly hardy. They're spirochetes and they are aerobic bacteria. So they can proliferate and live in, in urine saturated soil for long periods of time. So they love areas where they're stagnant or slow moving water. Uh, they love to live in neutral to slightly alkaline soils. And here in the Twin Cities, I feel like I see an increased number of diagnosis of leptospira in dogs, specifically following rain, rainfall in the summer months. So, you know, there's usually some sort of seasonal um, element associated with the infections. These guys, like other spirochetes, another common spirochete illust here in the United States is Borrelia burgdorferi, the um, common the agent associated with Lyme disease is these spirochete bacteria live an elusive lifestyle style. And so um, we'll in the future talk a little a bit about life cycles um, and just to kind of touch on why they're important with our diagnostic testing, but just know that bacteriemia is short and bacteriuria is intermittent. And last but not least, unfortunately, leptospira doesn't come as a cookie cutout. The clinical signs can mimic other diseases that specifically cause either signs of acute renal injury or hepatic injury. All right, so the pathogenesis. Now, I don't wanna make this a bacteriology lecture, um, so we'll just kind of touch on the reasons why, you know, leptospira, you know, how it works and why it, how this might pertain to some of the diagnostic testing. So first and foremost, the way that it enters in the body is that it penetrates intact mucous membranes or anywhere that we have epithelium that's been broken either through trauma or softening with water. It has an incredibly short incubation period. So that's helpful when it comes to history, at least for your side. For me though, because it has such a short incubation period and period in time in which we can actually detect the bacteria itself, knowing that we have that short incubation period is really important when selecting um, our, our diagnostic testings. We'll see it in the blood immediately, usually one day post-infection with the biggest clinical sign as it's replicating in the, in the vasculature being vasculitis, it eventually will disseminate more broadly and um, 
it come, go into the liver, and then for all leptospirous cereal have some sort of renal environment where it's shed in the urine. Next slide, please. So this is the heart for me of what I love. So you'll come in, you'll have a client, uh, a client that has a high clinical index of suspicion. And so you'll run hopefully a CBC in chemistry. In Minnesota, we really um, strongly encourage running a concurrent CBC with biochemistry and if possible, urine. Because here at least, when we see a CBC that has an inflammatory leukogram with potentially a thrombocytopenia, as almost up to 60% of dogs with lepto will have a thrombocytopenia, if I only had the CBC data, I might be starting to think I should go down the tick-borne disease route and start running some other tick-borne disease testing. So it's where the biochemistry with potentially the urinalysis really bring up our clinical index of suspicion. So with 80 to 90% of dogs with lepto, since all serovars of lepto invade the kidneys, we tend to see acute kidney injury in those dogs, which specifically would be azotemia with a reduced urine-specific gravity. Now, some of our serovars will invade the liver, and specifically when they inv invade the liver, they result in cholestatic patterns. So with plus or minus some hepatocellular in injury enzyme increases. And so when I'm thinking about what I'm looking for with this evidence of, of AKI and then cholestatic increases, specifically having an ALP that's higher than an ALT, and then if the increased total, increased total billing might um, send me over the edge, as we see up to 69% of dogs, when they present acutely with leptospira, will have an increased total bilirubin. So, you know, not all leptospira is created equally. There's oftentimes serovars, depending on what area of the world or the United States you are, there's one serovar that will predominate over another. Some are more likely to cause renal. Others are just to ha will have hepatic. And this slide's just to remind us that they're not all created equal, but they all tend to have renal involvement. Next slide, please. So you have a high index of suspicion. Now what are you going to do? All right. So going back to that life cycle and thinking about how we have such a short incubation period. So when we're in, when I know that we're in the early stages of disease, and I'm thinking the first seven days, I know that bacteremia is most common up to 10 days, but really it starts to drop off after six days, is that we'll start to think about those tests that detect bacteria in the first seven to 10 days, as those are the ones that we reach for. Leptospira does initiate a pretty great humoral response or antibody driven response. And so we will start to even reach pretty early for those tests. And so as they move into their chronic phase and chronic for leptospira is de um, defined as greater than two weeks, which is a little different than some of our other disease processes that we think of having more chronic, I'll start to reach for our serology tests and those tests that specifically look for antibodies. So what tests do we have in our bacteria-specific toolbox? All right, so before we talk about the major tests that we have at our disposal in our toolbox, some things to remember is that when we're specifically looking for bacteria, our sensitivity of those tests specifically will decrease exponentially if we decide to run them after starting antibiotics. So it is so important whenever we're reaching for a bacteria-specific test, that we make sure our animals have not started any, any antibiotics at that time, as it will potentially result in false negatives. If possible, or if we're kind of in that gray zone of um, you know, when they are presenting and when we think that they might have been exposed in, in that incubation period, we may consider running a blood and urine concurrently of our bacterial test to increase sensitivity of detection. All right. So let's run through the common bacterial diagnostic tests. I'm gonna talk about three. We'll talk about PCR, we'll talk about culture, and then dark field microscopy. PCR by far and away is the most common bacterial diagnostic test that we now use. It used to be dark field microscopy and potentially culture, but this is the mainstay of our bacterial diagnostic testing these days. Um, the commercial availability of tests through reference laboratories varies, um, just so that you know. and in one study, they found that a PCR assay conducted on blood had a sensitivity of 86% in the first six days of inspection, but dropped significantly after seven days of infection to 
Therefore, when we're thinking about um, what we're going to submit, whether we're going to submit blood or urine or both, we recommend submission of blood in the first 10 days and then urine after seven days or both when the exposure is unknown. So I know there's financial limitations, but when I'm guiding clinicians on which one we should send in or which one we, we shouldn't, because as you know, blood's oftentimes easier to get than urine in some cases. These are kind of some of the parameters that I use to help me make those decisions. We also know that studies have found that recent vaccination or a strong immune results can interfere with the detection of the PCR assay because those antibodies binding to the bacteria doesn't allow the PCR to, be, uh, to replicate and allow for amplification of that bacteria to be detected. Other things that can cause false negatives would be antibiotics or just low bacterial load. Remember, bacteremia is short and bacteriuria is intermittent. Additionally, we can see positive results in healthy dogs, which may indicate carrier states. So I'm very careful to recommend running PCR on only dogs that we have a high clinical index of suspicion for lepto, either through our clinical pathology data or through clinical presentation. So therefore, a positive test result should be um, interpret with caution, but we consider it consistent with clinical science and clinical pathology science is that if we see those things in the high index of suspicion, it's likely highly suggestive of infection. Next slide, please. So I'm only going to touch on culture. We really don't do this anymore um, because of the risk that it poses to our laboratory professionals, but also because incubation can take several months and it requires a very special expensive growth media. So it's not one that we recommend in clinical settings. It's oftentimes reached for in um, epidemiological settings. Next slide, please. And then last but not least is the one that at least I was uh, taught when I went back to, was in veterinary school initially and PCR was just coming on the block, is that we use dark field microscopy um, it uses a specialized microscope that looks specifically for the bacteria themselves within the blood or the urine. False positives can be common as there's other things that illuminate with dark field microscopy, um, and it's highly variable on uh, the training of the individual doing the test. So we tend not to use culture or dark field microscopy in current clinical settings anymore. All right. So now we've talked a little bit about the bacterial diagnostics, let's talk about what we have in our serology toolbox. And there's three specific tests. There's microscopic agglutination testing, which I'm gonna to refer to as MAT from this point on, ELISA testing, and then I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the point of care tests that are on the market. Though I'll be frank with you is that because I work in a tertiary care setting, I don't tend to interface directly with these point of care tests myself. We don't run them in my laboratory. Next slide. So before we can talk about the specific three specific tests today, things that we really need to consider when we're reaching for serology and try and understanding what those test results mean is just the idea of, of how they work. So things that are in our favor is that there's a very quick immune conversion in our patients with both vaccines and natural disease in these patients. So we have a quick immu um, immune conversion. We may need to pair these samples, especially in early stages of disease, as some of the tests that we're gonna talk about don't specifically target the IgM test results. And so those are the antibodies that are produced in early disease. All of these serology tests I'm going to talk about do, um, do succumb to vaccine interference. Depending on the laboratory and the country and where you are in the world, your serology tests that you send out may detect different serovars. And oftentimes in early disease, it's advantageous to combine these tests with one of the bacterial tests we talked about, usually PCR. All right. so. MAT or microscopic agglutination testing. So MAT's a really neat test. It is a test that uses serial dilutions of the patient's serum samples that will react with live leptospira cultures that is inoculated with. So laboratory grade bacteria is added to your patient's serum. And how we determine the titer is the highest dilution for which 50% of the leptospiras that are inoculated into that sample are agglutinated and we use dark field microscopy to detect that agglutination, which is essentially a turbidity or cloud, cloud measurement. We interpret the positive results, but we 
but have usually have factor in the acute and convalescent titers that are drawn seven to 14 days apart. And we're hoping to see this fourfold rise in antibody titers for an individual, and that's consistent with active infection. Next slide, please. So when we, like I said before, when we think about it, we're thinking about the fourfold increase, which means um, active infection. So some things to, to consider when we're, when we're interpreting these and looking at these is that because the mat is looking for this kind of turbidity or cloudiness in this dilution of this patient's sample, is that we see much, it's much easier to look for agglutination with IgG. And so with early infection, it may result in a negative or inconclusive mat with the single, the first acute titer. And so we found from studies that a single acute mat or that um, the first paired titer is about 50% sensitive for, for detecting acute leptospirosis infection. That sensitivity increases to 100% when we do a titer, you know, 14, seven to 14 days later. We know that vaccines, when we give a vaccine, that that vaccine response will induce both vaccinal and non-vaccinal subgroups, there's other leptospira in the environment that are non-pathogenic that it will show that we'll have antibody responses to. And that we can even get really, really large antibody responses to post-vaccine titers up to one to 600. And so, you know, that's important to keep in mind is that um, if we do have a patient that's been vaccinating, having a paired um, MAT is gonna be really important, especially if they've been vaccinated recently. We know that vaccine um, antibodies should wane after about four months, but that's not always the case in all patients. And last but not least um, is serovar cross-reaction. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so the next um, common serology test on the block is our ELISA. So these are a little different and they're becoming more commercially available because they don't need a live leptospira culture like the mat do. So it doesn't require certain biohazard and biosafety training of the laboratory personnel to run these tests. Depending on the specific ELISA, and it's different for all of them, so you'd have to ask um, your reference laboratory that you're running, these titers can detect IgM, IgG, or potentially both. As a reminder, we tend to see increases in IgM in the first week of early disease with a transition to IgG antibodies from weeks one to three. Therefore, an assay that um, targets IgM um, may be preferred in early infection, when, which is when our MAT has its lowest sensitivity. So being able to select for an ELISA that detects IgM may be advantageous in those uh, clinical settings. Next slide, please. All right. So last but not least is I'm gonna touch on some of the point of care cage side tests that are available. Uh, there's two that are currently on the market. There's the SNAP Lepto that's offered through IDEX Laboratories and the Witness Lepto that's offered through Zoetis. All right, so the SNAP Lepto test from IDEX. The SNAP lepto test specifically looks for antibodies against the, uh, the LIP-L32, which is a membrane-bound protein on the leptospira bacteria itself. This protein has particular interest because it is expressed only by pathogenic leptospiras and is occur conserved across zero groups. So we know with some of the vaccines that they um, will induce non-pathogenic uh, uh, antibodies. So when IDEX took a look at, the, um, at doing a performance assay, so comparing it to the MAT, so our MAT is considered to be our gold standard test, so Curtis and their group, when they did a performance assay and compared it to the MAT, specifically on dogs that had serum submitted to the reference lab laboratory looking for a specific diagnosis of lepto, so they, they had a high clinical index of suspicion, there was an 80% agreement when there was a titer of greater than or equal 1 to 800. They then looked at dogs that had um, serum that was submitted to the laboratory that were not suspected for clinical ear illness for um, leptospira. And they found that 96% of the time they had, fall they had a negative test result with those. So they do lend themselves to potentially having some false positives. 
This study was replicated or similar study was replicated in a clinical setting to see if there's detection of illness in a clinical setting. And what they found was that the assay was able to detect 68% detect of cases, but incorrectly identified 15% of dogs that had another illness. So again, verified is that, yes, we can get, uh, we can find dogs using this test that are truly positive, but there are false positives potentially associated with the SNAP lepto as well. In our, they also wanted to take a look at our vaccinated population. So we know that the that uh, protein is conserved in our only our pathogenic lepto, and so is it able to only pull uh, lepto antibodies that are um, targeted towards only active infection or non-vaccine induced um, um, antibodies? And so what they found is that when they looked at dogs in that same study, so um, this is that Curtis et al. study in the um, agreement study, they found that about a quarter of the dogs cross-reacted up to a year after post-vaccination. Um, I should say post-vaccination, not post-infection. That's a, a typo in my mistake. So there, it isn't a perfect test. It can't differentiate vaccine from, um, from natural infection. Next slide, please. So next, when we looked at the witness test, so this is a Zoetis, the other common test that we have, at least in the United States and in Europe, they have it in Europe. So the witness test is detecting IgM antibodies. So these are the antibodies that are produced in early infection using whole cell extracts from two different serovars, common serovars. So they did a similar performance assay that was um, done by IDEX using the similar methodologies. And what they found with the witness test is that it had a 98% sensitivity and 93.5% specificity in serum that was submitted to a reference laboratory for dogs that had a high index of suspicion for leptospira. And that was a French study. So um, a German group decided to do a, a prospective clinical study taking a look at cases of acute presentation of lepto in the clinical setting. And so what they found with that performance in that clinical setting is that dogs with the, that are presented with acute clinical disease and compared their witness lepto tests with a single or the acute mat titer in dogs that would ultimately go on to be diagnosed with lepto via PCR or by doing the paired or the convalescent titer with the mat is that there was a sensitivity of 75% compared to just doing the acute mat. When they did the same study and they looked at um, seeing if there was any cross reaction with vaccinated uh, versus uh, true infected dogs, they found that they did have cross reaction in dogs similar to the IDEX with 24% 12 weeks post infection. They did not take their study out to a year and then a little bit longer like the IDEX study did, and we do know that vaccine um, antibodies do wane potentially at four months in most dogs. So it, you know, it, it does have some discriminating. And we know that um, IgM is what's produced early in infection. But knowing that they are, there is still some vaccine cross-reaction. So what can we take home from the just the point of care test? This is the one uh, question that I commonly get from general practitioners in the area and also in our own community medicine group. And so with, you know, the things that I take home from these tests is they're, ama they're amazing screen screening tools. Um, they may be sensitive in early disease, which is something that we can struggle with with our uh, MAT testing and is why we really strongly recommend having that secondary follow-up one but that a positive test should prompt a confirmatory test. Oftentimes that doesn't change the course of, um, of treatment, but it will be good for uh, confirmation. A negative result in a dog with a high clinical index of suspicion doesn't rule out lepto. So these tests um, do have false negative rates. And so if you have that clinical pathology data and you have that, um, and you have a dog that looks like it, it walks and talks and looks like lepto, it, it may be advantageous depending on where it is in its disease uh, point to send off confirmatory tax testing. And that these tests cannot differentiate between vaccine and natural infection. So some of the conclusions is, um, you know, the lepto, uh, the classic clinical pathology signs is that we see acute kidney injury with plus or minus um, hepatic injury on laboratory tests. Unfortunately, there's not a single perfect test for lepto. 
And I really weigh heavily on where you think you are in the clinical disease port to help guide which tests that we should consider. So we, I tend to reach for those um, bacteria specific tests, specifically PCR in early disease. In the first 10 to 14 days is when I reach for those. If I'm thinking in the first six days of disease, um, blood, just doing blood, later doing urine, and if we're not sure, potentially combining them both. In those chronic, or some people consider it subacute disease, that one that's greater than 14 days out, that's when we might reach for antibody testing, potentially adding in urine detection um, with it, since we know there may be some ongoing bacteriuria, even in that 14 days. That, you know, if there's cross-reaction with vaccines, it's going to be really important to follow up with a convalescent titer. So potentially reaching for our MAT may be better than doing ELISA or um, some of those point of care testing. And that, you know, point of care testing is amazing screening tool, but ultimately when appropriate should be followed up with confirmatory testing. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you have. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and being there with me today. This is amazing. I can't I, hear you. I am muted. I did the, the classic, uh, after three years of Zooms and things, the classic Zoom mute. So Dr. Burton, thank you so much. That's awesome information. Um, if you do have some questions regarding testing, as that's our topic today, lepto testing, not so much treatment as we have other webinars on treatment, but please go ahead and type them in. I'm gonna get to them in just a couple of minutes or seconds, I should say. I just wanted to remind everyone, I know Justine is behind the scenes. I saw her typing in. Please go ahead and make sure you either, and I'm gonna bring up this slide, give me one hot second. All right, there we go. So please go ahead. We have our, Justine and I both typed it into the, the uh, question screen or the YouTube feed. I have it on the screen, the URL, as well as the QR code. Please make sure by 1 p.m. Eastern, which is about 30 minutes from now, you go ahead and fill out the form. That's how we know and we can confirm you are live in attendance at around 1 p.m. Eastern. Again, about 30 minutes from now, we will go ahead and close that down. So go ahead if you want your CE certificate. As we talked about at the beginning of the session, Again, a huge, huge thank you and shout out to Merck Animal Health. They're an amazing educational partner and it's with their support, we're able to provide this complimentary uh, race approved uh, CE event free to the veterinary world. So we love seeing where, uh, as we did in the beginning, you're, you're chatting in from, from around the country and around the world. So thank you for being here. So again, if you do have some questions, uh, please go ahead and uh, type them in. We do have a question here, and I'm going to see if I can be a little fancy for Dr. Burton. Put this on the screen. There we go. So Emily asked, do you ever see evidence of hepatic injury on your chemistry panel without any renal changes? So I'm going to assume, uh, Emily, what you're saying is the BUN and creatinine are normal, yet there are some elevations in our liver, uh, either cholestatic or hepatocellular enzymes. So Dr. Burton, what do you think about that? Yeah, so that's a really great um, that's a really great question, and um, I'm glad that you interpreted it the same way I did, Garrett. So that <laughs> that helps me with confirmation. I do. Um, you know, we as mentioned earlier, there are some serovars out there that will first target the liver before they move on to the the renal tissue. However, I would say that those um, cases are 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 not as common. They are the cases that I like to present to my residents for like um, often, but so they do, they definitely do happen. Eventually they should, they, the cases that I've been involved in, they do transition to over ha to having a concurrent azotemia, but in some of the ones that were the early, they, we can see that for sure. So great question, Emily. Yeah, it's a really good one. And I think, you know, we were taught at times, you know, only look here, only look here, but you know, as we're learning more and more about these diseases, we're were, and I think, Dr. Burton, you made a great point. I think one of the most overlooked things that I probably did myself in the beginning uh, of learning about lepto and practicing clinically years ago was not really looking for that thrombocytopenia. And I think that's something that's a nice little light bulb moment when you see that on your CBC to say, hmm, that's weird. You know, I always joke, there's no cat that knows how to uh, show platelets on an in-house CBC machine at least. And so we look at it in the microscope, we confirm, Truly thrombocytopenia does exist, but those are little sort of light bulb moments that I think of to say, is there something that I'm missing here? And now we know, you know, don't always say it always has to be renal or is only liver. Look for those little subtle cues that really, really help. Um, and and, uh, and I, I find that uh, 
we can catch them earlier rather than when they're they come in you know high letter yellow glowing from icterus and everything else going on or severe azotemia so you know absolutely is great great points and thank you emily great Great question. If you do have other questions about lepto testing, we'll try to get to one or two more. I do want to be respectful of everyone's time as we're just a few minutes over with such great information. It's hard to hard to stop. In fact, Dr. Burton and I were chatting uh, before the, the session started and I went, oh my God, it's 12 o'clock. We were having such a good conversation about everything we were going to chat about today. So I think we could have probably made this a, a three hour I know to get all the information in. We're so excited about these. And I just get, I get so excited to talk. I forget that I'm like, I'm a time and I just get in the zone and I'm super excited. So sorry. I went over a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. It, you actually ended on, on, on a perfect time, but uh, we maybe actually started a minute late with all of our, our fun chat about things that are going on. Remember, like we talked about, if you want to, head to both just justine and dr burton's backyard vector all you will be in minnesota at the end of this month i can't believe as i look at my watch here we're already in august and vector all you will be just at the end of this month so make sure you sign up some great talks great ce it's a great boutique experience amazing swag great energy so go ahead and uh make sure you sign up because we do have a few seats that are left any other questions please go ahead and type them in i'll wait another couple of seconds to see if we get any more um, but if not, I will also say is we're, oh, we do have one. Let's see here. Hmm. It's a good question. And, and, and I'll say, Dr. Burton, it's a little bit of an open-ended question. So, you know, interpret as we will. But sometimes it's challenging with clients. I, I've dealt with this myself, multi-pet household. We didn't know which pet was sick first, who was puking in the corner, which one of my three dogs, which one wasn't eating when they all get fed together. But do you have any... Um, any either testing or other tips that you see clinical uh, from a clinical pathologic setting of, of, of what you would do or what tests you would talk about if they weren't sure? Because I remember when you were talking, you said, well, in the first 14 days, we're going to think of acute. And then after 14 days, we think of chronic or maybe subacute. But is there something you can help us with to say, is there a, a testing pattern you would recommend or something you would think about without a clearer discussion of when the disease or illness started? Yeah, so this is a question I commonly have with um, the clinicians in the hospital. Like, this is the conundrum. Like, who is the dog that we think is, you know, has lepto? Or like, when did it happen? You know, I I personally rely really heavily on the CBC and looking at the inflammatory leukogram because I just think about neutrophils tend to have a lifespan of about forty eight hours, and so if we're still having a pretty really really intense inflammatory response, that helps guide me that we may still be in the acute part of the disease. Not always, but it's something that I use to help me. And also I, I tend to see thrombocytopenia more commonly in the acute disease, but um, in the patients that have thrombocytopenia, I'll say, not, like we said, only about 50% have thrombocytopenia. So I rely on my CBC and then just really, you know, asking more probing questions of the clinician and then the client. So great point. Yeah. It's an um, interesting point about the neutrophils and, and, and how they change. Uh, you know, that's one of the tough questions I think we all face at times. And like I said, the multi-pet household who is sick? When do they start? Finally, you figure out one dog isn't eating because the other dogs are eating all its food. And then you realize, oh my, you look thin or you have been vomiting or now that I actually took you outside and didn't watch you just go in the fenced yard, you were the one having diarrhea. So all those fun um, investigator hats that we have to put on sometimes with clients to ask those good probing questions. Well, Dr. Yeah. Burton, again, thank you so much. This is awesome information. A lot of great feedback. Testing can be challenging, but I think uh, it's a lot easier after listening to your lecture and, and hearing some of those clips and, and, and subtle cues that we can look at to decide which test we're going to run, why we're going to run, and, and importantly, I think how to interpret it. So thank you so much for being here again. Everyone that was with us live, please make sure you fill out that registration form so we know you are here. And within a couple of days, we will cross-reference and get you your CE certificate. We do have another webinar tonight, so check that out on our website. And please... If you are on the fence and thinking about Vectoral U and Dr. Burton in Justine's backyard, this is the time. Go ahead and sign up. Trust me, you will not be sad unless you don't register and you miss out and then see all those cool posts on social media. I don't want you to be sad. That's what we're here for. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day, great rest of their week. Enjoy the rest of your summer. And I hope to see everyone in a couple of weeks out in Dr. Burton's backyard in Minnesota. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, so. all.